Matt Dean with A-plus College Ready. And today we're going to talk a little bit about ecosystem ecology. So an ecosystem consists of a community of organisms together with their physical environment. Ecosystems vary in size and also diversity. Ecosystems with a higher species diversity tend to be more stable and resilient, meaning they're better able to uh, come back after some kind of natural disaster or disturbance. Ecosystems can be marine, they can be freshwater, or terrestrial. The terrestrial ecosystems are usually grouped into uh, biomes, which are distinct biological communities that have formed in response to some kind of shared physical climate. So we've got a table on the next slide that lists some of the major terrestrial biomes. Most of you have seen these since elementary school. Just point out a couple. We've got the tundra, which is located up near the North Pole. Climate is very, very cold. Um, some per precipitation, mostly a snow. Some example of the flora that live there, the plants are the tundra flowers, mosses, lichens, small grasses, and shrubs. The fauna, the animals that live there are things like um, deer, some rodents, bears, no, notice it's mostly mammals. If we skip down and look at something like um, a chaparral, here we're talking about like on the west coast of, um, of um, South America, west coast of Africa. Um, it's very, very hot. Um, hot. Hot, dry summer gets up to like 100 degrees. There's lots of droughts, um, mild winters in terms of the flora that live there, um, things with um, small leaves that hold on to moisture, like the yucca, uh, sagebrush, the cedar, the olive tree, um, and some of the fauna that live there are things that can handle dryness. So the cactus wren, kangaroo, roadrunners, jackrabbits, and so on. So that's just a handful of terrestrial biomes. So in terms of biome distribution, here we see where the biomes are found. So tropical rainforest in deep green, South America, Central America, uh, central part of Africa, um, some parts of Asia. Um, for example, um, where we live here in Alabama, we're in a temperate deciduous forest. Notice those are also found in parts of Europe, uh, also parts of Asia. We have the tundra, um, extreme north. Uh, we have the um, um, savannas, for example, out in um, certain parts of Africa, um, places where we find all kinds of uh, famous animals that we see in the zoos. See some of those also in Australia, some of those savannas. All right, so let's talk a little bit about energy and matter in ecosystems. So oftentimes ecologists are interested in tracing the movement of energy and matter through the ecosystem. Notice this part in bold here. One of the most important ideas related to this topic is that matter is recycled through an ecosystem. The atoms that make up matter are used over and over and over and over and over. They're not used up, they don't go away. They move from one part of the food chain to another part and eventually they start over again. But energy flows through and eventually out of an ecosystem. It usually comes in as sunlight that's captured by some kind of photosynthesizer. And ultimately it usually leaves the ecosystem as some type of thermal energy or heat. So let's talk a bit about matter recycling. So we know that, let's, let's talk about a, an example with photosynthesis and respiration. So plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and some other nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil through the roots, and they use that to build their biomolecules. Animals eat the plants and they use those carbon atoms and oxygen atoms and nitrogen atoms and phosphorus atoms to build their own biomolecules. Well, those animals get eaten by another animal. Ultimately, those same carbons and oxygens and nitrogens and phosphoruses are used to build the next animal in the food chain. And that keeps going until eventually we get to the top of the food chain 
that organism dies, decomposers break down that organism, and the cycle starts over. But those atoms don't go away. They're recycled over and over again in the food chain. Here we can see some of that. So we see we're going from bottom of the food chain, producer, to primary consumer, to secondary consumer. Eventually decomposers break them all down, put those simple molecules and atoms back into the ground. They become available to plants again and the cycle starts over. So key word there, matter is recycled over and over through an ecosystem. Unlike matter, we said the flow of energy through an ecosystem is one directional. It's um, one way. As I said earlier, energy usually enters an ecosystem as sunlight. It's captured in, into some kind of chemical form by photosynthesizers, like plants and algae, cyanobacteria. It's passed through the ecosystem, um, changing forms as organisms metabolize the biomolecules that they eat, make some waste. Um, each time that energy changes forms, some of it, in a lot of cases, a big part of it is converted into heat. Heat leaves the organism and goes out into the environment. It's still a form of energy. It's not destroyed, but typically it can't be used as an energy source by living things. And ultimately, all the energy that entered the ecosystem is going to leave it as heat and it's going to radiate back out into space. So because energy flows in this one directional manner, an ecosystem has to have a constant incoming supply of energy. And almost always, this is sunlight. So here we can see that we've got the sun providing the energy in. Each part of the, the, the food chain is giving off heat energy, which again was going to radiate out into to space. Notice even the decomposers do that. So energy flows in as sunlight. It flows out of the ecosystem as heat. So you guys have seen food chains. You know that a food chain is a diagram that depicts the series of organisms that eat one another to get their energy and their nutrients. Food chains begin with an autotroph or a primary producer. The two major types of autotrophs are photoautotrophs, things like plants, algae, and cyanobacteria that use carbon dioxide and light energy to make their organic molecules like sugars. And then there are also chemoautotrophs. These are typically bacteria found near undersea volcanic vents that use the energy from, from certain chemicals, usually inorganic hydrogen sulfide to build organic molecules from CO2. Everything else in the food chain is a heterotroph or a consumer. These have to eat other organisms to get their nutrients and their energies. So the herbivores that eat the primary producers are the primary consumers. The organisms that eat the primary consumers are the secondary consumers. It's usually there's some kind of carnivore. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers. And if there's another level present, that next level up is called the quaternary consumer. Typically, the organisms at the very top of the food chain, regardless of what level we're at, are called the apex or top level consumers. Each of these categories, primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, these are called trophic levels. And each trophic level represents a link in a food chain. Now, even though they're not always shown, decomposers, things like fungi and algae, or fungi and bacteria rather, are considered to be their own trophic level. Um, there's even some multicellular animals like earthworms and crabs and slugs and even vultures that are called detritivores. These are decomposers, but they also help to, to make the, the decomposing material more available for the bacteria and the fungi by breaking it up and so forth. So decomposers eat dead matter and waste products from all of the trophic levels. And in addition to performing the role of decomposition, Maybe the more important thing they do is that they release the nutrients and the minerals from those decomposing waste and dead matter and put them back into the soil, back into the environment so they can be recycled. So we think of decomposers as mineral recyclers or atom recyclers.
matter recyclers even. So here we see just a really basic food chain. We've got corn or maize. It's the producer, primary producer. The locust is the primary consumer. It eats the corn. The lizard is the secondary consumer. It eats the grasshopper or the locust. And the snake is the tertiary consumer. It eats the lizard. So oftentimes, because of the complexity of the diets of many things, food chains uh, are not completely accurate representations of what's really going on. In these situations, we need a food web. A food web is essentially many intersecting food chains put together. In a food web, arrows point from an organism that is eaten to the organism that eats it. And you'll see in the example we're about to look at, some organisms eat more than one other organism, and they may eat organisms from completely different trophic levels. Let's look at an example. Let's take the um, let's take the leopard seal for example. So the leopard seal um, eats fish. That's one of the things that it eats. Fish eat zooplankton or zooplankton, which eat phytoplankton. So that would mean this would be a producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. So in that particular food chain. The leopard seal is a tertiary consumer. But notice the leopard seal also might eat a penguin. So let's look at that, that food chain. So the seaweed is the producer. The crab is the primary consumer. The squid is the secondary consumer. The penguin is the tertiary consumer. That would make in this food chain, the leopard seal is the quaternary consumer. So the leopard seal is eating things from completely different food chains. We also could look at the, the seagull. The leopard seal also eats a seagull. So that food chain starts out with phytoplankton as a producer, zooplankton as a primary consumer, fish as a secondary consumer, seagulls as a tertiary consumer, and the leopard seal is a quaternary consumer. So let's talk about energy transfer through food chain or food web. So energy is transferred between trophic levels when one organism eats the, uh, the energy rich organic molecules in another organism's body. These energy transfers are very, very, very inefficient. Um, and because they're so inefficient, this, this limits not only the length of the food chain and the number of trophic levels, but also the number of organisms found at each trophic level. When energy is transferred to a new trophic level, some of it is stored as biomass in the bodies of the consumers. This energy is then available to the next trophic level. Only energy stored as biomass is, can be consumed. So as a rule, only about 10% of the energy that's stored as biomass in one trophic level ends up stored as biomass in the next trophic level. That rule of thumb, it's not always exact, is called the rule of 10 or the 10% rule of energy transfer. This essentially means that 90% of the energy uh, in one trophic level doesn't make it up to be stored in the next trophic level. 90% is essentially lost and unavailable. 10% makes it and is stored as biomass. Because of this really inefficient transfer of energy between levels, like I said before, the length of food chains is generally limited usually to either three to six trophic levels. And the number of organisms at the upper trophic levels is extremely small because there's not very much energy available. So we're going to look at a diagram on the next slide that sort of shows how this works. So our primary consumers, our plants, take in sunlight and store about 20,000 kilocalories per square meter per year of energy. Those are eaten by the primary consumers. Of that 20,000 kilocalories per square meter per year, only about 2,000 of that ends up being stored in the bodies of the primary consumers. Those uh, primary consumers are eaten by the secondary consumers, like the, the frog, for example, or the toad. Only about 200 
of the 2,000 kilocalories from the second trophic level is stored in the bodies of the secondary consumers. The snakes eat the secondary consumers. Only about 20 calories of the 200 in the previous trophic level end up stored in their bodies. And then we've got the quaternary consumers. Only about 2 kilocalories out of that original 20,000 ends up stored as biomass in there. So the question is, where's all the energy go? Because the key point is energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's not used up. It's just changed to another form. And notice one of those forms is heat. So as I said a second ago, if, if only 10% of the energy stored as biomass in a trophic level ends up stored as biomass in the next level, where's it go? The first law of thermodynamics tells us you can't create energy, you can't destroy it, it's not used up. So there's three possible ways that energy leaves the food chain. One of them is heat energy. And this is where a lot of it goes. Some of it is contained in undigestible waste. So some of the organic molecules that are eaten can't be digested. The energy in those molecules ends up in the feces. There's also some organisms in a level that don't get eaten. Not every plant gets eaten, for example. So there's still calories, there's still energy in those organisms um, that die before they're eaten. Eventually, the feces and the uneaten organisms are consumed by decomposers. He gets released, and at some point, all the energy that entered the food chain as light leaves the food chain as heat and radiates back out into space. So another way to, to represent the amount of energy that's stored in living tissues is to, instead of looking at an energy pyramid like we looked at on the previous slide, look at a biomass pyramid. So this is showing you how much biomass is in each trophic level. So notice the grasses um, have way more biomass than the rabbits. The rabbits way more biomass than the wolf. And it's not perfect here, but notice this also is, almost follows that 10% rule. You can also look at what's called a pyramid of numbers. This shows you how many individual organisms are found at each trophic level. So aquatic plants, we've got nearly 12,000. The caddis fly larvae that feed on those plants, about 1,900. The fish that feed on the larvae, about 300. And the bigger fish that feed on the blue kills, only about 13 of those. So again, same kind of idea. Here we're looking at numbers of organisms. The previous diagram, we were looking at biomass of organisms. And in the first one, we're actually looking at energy. So we've got pyramids of energy, pyramids of biomass, and pyramids of numbers. Different ways to illustrate essentially the same relationship. So now let's talk a little bit about energy flow and what's called primary productivity. So plants, algae, and autotrophic bacteria, like cyanobacteria, are the producers, and they act essentially like an energy gateway for the earth. They're the only organisms that are capable of taking in the sunlight or other inorganic, taking in energy from other inorganic molecules and using that energy to create organic molecules like sugar. They're the entry points for energy into a food chain. The energy that's stored in the organic molecules that, that they make, either directly or indirectly, provides the needed energy for all the consumers in all of the different trophic levels. So an important term is productivity. It's the rate at which energy is stored in the bodies of organisms as biomass. And we talk about two different measures of productivity. Gross primary productivity, abbreviated as GPP, and net primary productivity, abbreviated as NPP. So gross primary productivity is the rate at which solar energy is captured and stored in sugar molecules during photosynthesis. Think of GPP as a way of measuring the entire amount of sugars that are made in an ecosystem by photosynthesis. So think about it as measuring all the photosynthesis that happens. Net primary productivity, on the other hand, NPP, is equal to the gross primary productivity 
minus the rate at which energy is lost due to things like cell respiration and other metabolic activities. Think of MPP as a measure of the amount of sugars that remain after the producers have used photosynthesis to produce the sugars and cell respiration to break down some of them for their own needs, for their own metabolism. So we've got an equation that allows us to calculate NPP and GPP. So net primary productivity is equal to the gross primary productivity, which remembers a measure of photosynthesis minus cell respiration. So since oxygen is one of the most easily measured products of photosynthesis and one of the most easily measured reactants of aerobic cell respiration, a good way to estimate primary productivity levels in a, at least an aquatic ecosystem is to measure the levels of oxygen that's dissolved in the water, dissolved oxygen, or DO. Okay? So it's not possible to directly measure gross productivity because respiration and photosynthesis happen at the same time. But we can indirectly measure it by first calculating the NPP. Um, and so, so let's talk about how this might happen. So first of all, we can uh, estimate the amount of cell respiration uh, that happens by measuring the changes in dissolved oxygen that occur in the dark. Because in the dark, cell respiration happens, photosynthesis doesn't. Then we can take the same organism, same container, and measure the changes in um, dissolved oxygen that occur in the light. Well, in the light, you have photosynthesis and cell respiration both occurring. So that's a measure of net primary productivity. So in the light, we can get a measure of net primary productivity. In the dark, we can get a measure of respiration uses. And we can use our equation down at the bottom to calculate the gross primary productivity. Let's look at some examples. So water with algae inside is placed in a completely dark environment. If the dissolved oxygen concentration of the water in the bottle is 12 milligrams of oxygen per liter of water, and the dissolved oxygen concentration after an hour in the dark is eight milligrams per liter, how much oxygen was consumed by the plants per hour? So we started off with 12, we ended up with eight. Oxygen was used up. Four milligrams per liter of it was used up per hour. We simply subtracted. And the process that consumes that oxygen is aerobic cellular respiration. So we get four milligrams of oxygen used per liter every hour due to cell respiration. So now we have, think of it as the same bottle uh, with an initial concentration of 12 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. This time we put that bottle in the light for an hour. And after an hour, our DO levels are at 25 milligrams per liter. So how much net oxygen is produced per hour? Well, we started with 12, we ended up with 25. So we take 25 minus 12, we net 13 milligrams per liter per hour. But remember in the light, both photosynthesis and respiration are occurring. So let's look at problem three. Assume the bottles described uh, in problems one and two are the same bottles. What is the gross primary productivity in milligrams per liter? So we use our equation, NPP equals GPP minus R. Let's rearrange that equation and solve for GPP. So here's our equation after we solve for GPP. NPP is our net primary productivity. We measure that in the light. So our change in dissolved oxygen in the light was 13. Respiration, we can measure in the dark. And in the dark, we measured a change of four milligrams per liter. So we put 13 here, four here. So we end up with a gross primary productivity of 17 milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. So the formula sheet for AP Biology, the one you can use on your exam, has some formulas for primary productivity calculations. Here are the formulas that are included. These equa equations allow you to use changes in dissolved oxygen, assuming it's measured in milligrams per liter, to calculate the milligrams of carbon that are fixed per liter. 
carbon that's uh, incorporated into biomass, essentially, is what we're looking for. So carbon fixation is essentially a measurement of how much inorganic carbon from carbon dioxide is incorporated into in, to organic molecules like sugars or proteins and so on. So these, these, these equations are going to allow us to use DO measurements and convert those DO measurements into carbon stored as biomass. So here's a, a sample problem. The initial dissolved oxygen concentration in a tank of water that includes algae is 9.25 milligrams per liter. The tank is placed under a light source for 24 hours. The final dissolved oxygen reading is 12.75. Calculate the net amount of carbon fixed by the algae over the 24 hour period. So first of all, we're gonna calculate the NPP in milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. So we're gonna take our final DO reading and subtract from it our initial DO reading. So this is our net primary productivity in terms of milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. This is net because this, this happened in the light when both photosynthesis and cell respiration were both occurring. Photosynthesis was happening faster than respiration because our DO levels went up. Photosynthesis makes oxygen, oxygen gas. Aerobic cell respiration uses oxygen gas. So next we're gonna use the top primary productivity equation, this one. And that's gonna allow us to convert from milligrams of oxygen per liter to milliliters of oxygen per liter of water. So we plug in, here's our 3.50 milligrams per liter. Our formula tells us to multiply that by 0.698 and that gives us a conversion of 2.44 milliliters of oxygen per liter of water. Next, we'll use the, the bottom primary productivity equation, this one, to convert from milliliters of oxygen per liter of water to milligrams of carbon fixed per liter of water. So we take our 2.44 from the previous calculation. Our formula tells us to multiply that by 0.536 so our calculation tells us we have a net primary productivity of 1.31 milligrams of carbon fixed per liter of water. So this is how much carbon was stored as biomass during our 24 hour period. So let's talk a bit more about dissolved oxygen. It's important to note that there's some other factors that other than photosynthesis and cell respiration that can affect dissolved oxygen levels in the water. One of those is temperature. The hotter the temperature of the water, the lower the dissolved oxygen. Hotter temperatures cause oxygen to leave water. The lower the temperature of the water, the higher the dissolved oxygen levels. Colder water can store more dissolved oxygen. Movement also affects DO levels. Typically faster moving water is going to contain higher levels of dissolved oxygen. Slow moving stagnant water is going to have low levels of dissolved oxygen. Salinity is another factor. Typically more saline, more salty environments are going to have less DO. Less salty environments are going to have more DO. So one of the final topics we're going to talk about here are what are called biogeochemical cycles. We already established that energy flows through an ecosystem and is eventually dissipated as heat, but the chemical elements that make up life are recycled over and over again. The ways in which these elements and sometimes compounds like water move and are recycled between living things in the environment, those are called biogeochemical cycles. In this class, we're going to talk about four of those. We're going to talk about the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle and the water cycle. Those are all very important to life. So we'll start with the carbon cycle. And I'm just gonna talk about the carbon cycle from a diagram. So the carbon cycle is mostly about photosynthesis and cell respiration. So there's lots of carbon, inorganic carbon in the air as carbon dioxide. That CO2 is taken in by our plants and our algae and our cyanobacteria. It's incorporated into the biomolecules 
of those plants becomes organic carbon. That organic carbon is eaten, in this case by cows, but any kind of primary consumer or by a decomposer. Those organisms, somewhere along the food chain, do aerobic cell respiration on those, on those sugars. And one of the waste products of aerobic respiration is CO2, which is released back into the environment. So photosynthesis is taking in the CO2, incorporating into organic molecules. Cell respiration is breaking down the organic molecules, releasing the CO2 back into the environment. And that can happen at any level of the food chain, even the decomposers. Some other things that can happen with CO2, um, humans have had several impacts on the carbon cycle. One of those is the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are carbon-based molecules. When we burn them, we give off CO2. And we know that by burning gas and oil, we've increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's some theories that that CO2 acts as what we call a greenhouse gas and helps to trap heat in the environment and has contributed to, uh, to global warming. The uh, oceans and other bodies of water can take in CO2 and store it. Um, some organic matter can be pushed down into the earth and eventually under pressure and heat form fossil fuels. So all of those things are part of the carbon cycle. Let's also talk about the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is very abundant on earth, but most of earth's nitrogen is found in the form of N2 gas. Over 70% of the atmosphere is made of nitrogen gas. But the two nitrogen in an N two nitrogen atoms in an N2 molecule are held together by very strong triple covalent bonds. Most plants and animals can't metabolize it or, or use those nitrogen atoms. So there's four major processes that help to, to cycle nitrogen through the environment. They're nitrogen fixation, decomposition or ammonification, nitrification and denitrification. So nitrogen fixation is a term that describes processes that convert the uh, into atmospheric into into forms of nitrogen uh, containing molecules that can be metabolized. One of those is atmospheric nitrogen fixation. So in this process, lightning essentially strikes nitrogen molecules that are in the atmosphere. Um, allows those nitrogen atoms to combine with oxygen to make nitrogen oxides, which dissolve in the rain and form nitrates that are carried down to the earth and ultimately into the soil. A second process is called biological nitrogen fixation. This is when bacteria or archaea, which either are free living in the soil or in the water, or maybe some of them live in mutualistic symbiotic relationships with plant roots like uh, legumes, like soybeans and such. These take in into and convert that into, into ammonia, NH3. This ammonia, most of it is quickly absorbed by the plants and is used by the plants to create things like proteins and, and other organic nitrogen containing molecules like DNA, for example. There's also a third process called industrial nitrogen fixation. Scientists figured out that under high pressure and high temperature, chemists could synthesize ammonia from atmospheric nitrogen. And this is the basis for the creation of nitrogen containing fertilizers, whether they use ammonia directly or convert it into ammonium nitrate. So this is a, the way scientists create artificial nitrogen based fertilizers. So then we've got decomposition or ammonification. So the nitrogen containing proteins and the DNA and RNA made by plants, algae, and cyanobacteria pass through food chains, food webs, just like sugars do. At every trophic level, some of these molecules are metabolized. Um, they produce nitrogen containing molecules that return to the environment in either excretions or in the dead bodies. Microorganisms break down these organic nitrogen containing molecules and convert them back into ammonia, NH3. That's why it's called ammonification. The ammonia produced from the decay, some of it's taken directly uh, by plant roots. A lot of it though is converted by bacteria or archaea into nitrates, which would be like an NO2 minus one, 
or nitrates, NO3 minus one, via this process called nitrification. Finally, denitrification reduces, here we don't mean like lowers the amount, here we mean um, adds electrons to nitrates and nitrites in the soil and ultimately converts those back into nitrogen gas, which goes back up into the air and starts the process over again. So here we can see the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen fixing bacteria, either living on plant roots or the soil, carry out nitrogen fixation. Convert that into, into typically ammonia. Um, that ammonia is absorbed by plants, used to make nitrogen containing organic molecules. Those are eaten by consumers or ultimately uh, decomposers. Um, and we get ammonification, where those nitrogen containing biomolecules are converted back to ammonia or ammonium ion. That ammonia or ammonium ion is then nitrified. It goes through nitrification, where it's converted into nitrates or nitrites and nitrates, and then it gets denitrified by bacteria and turned back into nitrogen gas. Now, humans have also had an impact on the nitrogen cycle. Um, we learned how to create artificial fertilizers. We also release a lot of sewage and other nitrogen containing waste into bodies of water. Um, typically, the levels of, of nitrogen, usable nitrogen in the water is low. And oftentimes, nitrogen is a limiting factor for plant growth and algae growth. Eutrophication occurs when a body of water receives an excessive nutrient load. Usually, it's nitrogen can also be phosphorus. So that nitrogen was a limiting factor, but now it's not anymore. So the algae in that body of water grow like crazy. Ultimately, they start to die, have a very short lifespan. They start to decompose under the water. Well, decomposition, a large part of it is aerobic cellular respiration. So that uses up the oxygen that's in the water. So the dissolved oxygen levels in the water drop. This ends up causing a, a die-off of all kinds of underwater aquatic plants, fish. Most of the life of the plant of the, of the lake or pond dies because too much nitrogen was in the water, and ultimately it caused the dissolved oxygen levels to drop down near zero. So that's called eutrophication. Let's also talk a minute about the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is also an essential nutrient for animals and plants. It's important in cell development. It's an important uh, part of biomolecules like ATP, DNA, and the phospholipids that make up our cell membranes. Um, not enough phosphorus in the soil also can slow plant growth. Phosphorus is found on earth in a lot of different compounds, like phosphate ion, which is PO4 minus three. Um, but generally the amount of phosphorus in the soil is pretty small. And this often limits plant growth. This is why um, people oftentimes apply phosphate-based fertilizers to farmland. It helps the plants grow faster. Animals typically get their phosphates by eating plants or plant-eating animals. Turns out most of Earth's phosphorus is stored in rocks as inorganic phosphate. Um, over time, things like rain and weathering cause the rocks to release phosphates. They get distributed in the soil and the groundwater, and that inorganic phosphate is taken up by plants, and then the plants use it to make their own organic biomolecules, like phospholipids and DNA. Animals get the phosphorus they need by eating these plants or other animals that ate the plants. Once a plant or animal dies and decays, the organic phosphate is returned to the soil, and in the soil, bacteria break down that organic matter and convert the organic phosphate back into inorganic phosphate. That process is called mineralization. Some of this phosphate can end up in the sediments and can be pushed down and ultimately turned back into rock form where the cycle starts over again. So here we see the phosphorus cycle. Again, most, most of Earth's phosphorus is contained in rocks as phosphate. We get weathering and erosion, which release it it gets taken up by plants or algae. 
um, which use it to make their phosphorus containing organic molecules. Animals get the phosphorus they need by eating the plants or other animals that ate the plants. Like with the nitrogen cycle, humans have had an impact on the phosphorus cycle. Um, a lot of detergents, for example, used to contain high amounts of phosphorus. Um, sewage contains phosphorus. When those have been released into bodies of water, because the phosphorus acted as a limiting reactant on algal growth, once those extra, once extra phosphate was put into the water, again, we ended up with eutrophication, this crazy algal bloom. And ultimately, after the algal bloom, as the algae die and are decomposed by cell respiration, it causes dissolved oxygen levels in the water to drop to critical levels, causing a die off of lots of the plant and animal life in the water. So that's usually caused by human um, interaction with the environment, human waste products being released into some kind of body of water. Now, the last cycle, biogeochemical cycle we'll mentioned is a water cycle. This is one you guys have studied since first grade, probably. Water cycle is also called the hydrologic cycle. So we know that water evaporates from bodies of water like lakes, swamps, rivers, and oceans, makes water vapor. The water vapor rises, cools off, condenses back into tiny droplets of water that makes clouds. The clouds then drop that water as either rain or snow, call that precipitation. And then the precipitation is absorbed either into the ground or it runs off into rivers and streams or oceans. Um, the water that's absorbed into the ground is ultimately taken up by plants and plants move that water up through their stems and out their leaves through a process called transpiration, ultimately releasing water vapor back into the air. Water that runs off into the rivers flows into ponds, lakes, oceans, it evaporates, starts the cycle back over again. So just like with all the other biogeochemical cycles we've mentioned today, humans have impacted the water cycle. We've extracted a lot of groundwater for uh, use in homes or use in agriculture, like um, um, watering crops in commercial uses. That's lowered the amount of water underground, the water table. Cities and urbanization have led to more runoff and more contamination of our rivers and our streams and even our underground water sources. By burning fossil fuels, combustion releases water vapor into the air and we've increased the amount of water vapor in the air due to combustion. And then we've also created these large water reservoirs with, by damming. And this has caused the drying up of many small streams. Um, because we're storing more of the water on land, it can cause a decrease in sea levels. And it can also block the migration of different kinds of animals like fish. So here we see our, our water cycle, evaporation. Um, ultimately, we get condensation, forming clouds, um, precipitation. We get groundwater runoff. Um, notice we've got transpiration. All of the parts that we talked about in our previous points are, are on this diagram. It's a really good depiction of the water cycle. So let's finish this screencast up by talking about two other topics. Let's talk about movement of water through a plant. So we know water is absorbed by the roots of a plant. Oftentimes this absorption is aided by the, the large surface area created by the little hairs on the roots, the root hairs. Um, the cells of the roots have a higher solute concentration than the surrounding groundwater. So they have more salts and other things dissolved in them. This causes the water potential in the root to be lower than the water potential of the groundwater. Well, water always moves from areas of higher water potential, in this case, in the ground, to areas of lower water potential, in this case, into the root. So the water enters the root, eventually it goes into the xylem, the water conducting tissues of the plant. The water molecules stick together through cohesion and they stick to the xylem through adhesion because of their polarity. And this helps to draw the water up the xylem and up the stem of the plant. The water continues to move upward until it reaches a stomate, 
a little pore on the underside, usually on the underside of a leaf. There, the liquid water evaporates from the stomate. But since the water is connected in um, chains by hydrogen bonds, when one water molecule leaves as water vapor, it pulls up um, a drop of liquid water behind it. And this helps to continue the upward movement of the water. It's important to note that within the plant, the water potential is highest at the roots and it decreases as water moves up all the way to the stomate. Osmosis moves water passively from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. Transpiration is an example of this type of passive transport. The plant doesn't have to use any of its own ATP to move water um, through the xylem. So here we see a diagram showing us the water potentials um, and how, how this uh, uh, contributes to transpiration. So in the root cells, the water potential is around negative 0.2. In the stem, it's negative 0.6. Well, negative 0.2 is higher than negative 0.6. Well, we get up to the leaf. The water potential has dropped to negative 1.5. Out in the atmosphere, the water potential is negative 100. So all the way along its journey from ground all the way to stomate and ultimately into the air, the water moves from areas of higher water potential to areas of lower water potential. So there's several factors that can affect the rate of transpiration, how fast it happens. One of those is temperature. Typically hotter temperatures cause faster transpiration because heat increases evaporation, which in turn increases transpiration rates. Relative humidity, higher humidity makes it harder for evaporation to occur. So when humidity is higher, transpiration rates are lower. When humidity is lower, transpiration rates are higher. Wind or air movement is another factor. Wind, um, one, helps to lower the humidity around the leaf and the stomate. Two, it also helps to increase evaporation. Either way you look at it, higher winds cause faster transpiration. Lower winds, lower transpiration. The amount of moisture in the soil affects transpiration rates. When the soil gets very dry, plants tend to, to age, close their stomates, slow down transpiration. When the soil is moist, plants live and, and thrive. They keep their stomates open. Transpiration happens faster. And the final factor we'll mention is the type of plant. Different kinds of plants transpire faster than others. Plants that grow in very uh, dry places, like deserts, for example, talk about the cactus, they transpire very slowly because they're trying to conserve water because it's, it's a, such a precious, rare resource. All right, my very last topic on this screencast is biological magnification. This oftentimes occurs as a result of water contamination. It occurs when the, the concentration of poisonous substances found in the bodies of living things increases as you move up the food chain. A good example of this is uh, mercury contamination. In most cases, the concentration of mercury in contaminated water is really, really low. Some of this mercury is absorbed by plankton. The mercury is fat soluble. And that means that once it's absorbed by an organism, it's stored in its fat and it essentially stays there. So this, because the plankton is constantly absorbing water and constantly absorbing mercury and storing it, the plankton ends up with a higher mercury concentration than the water around it. Well, small fish eat the plankton. They don't just eat one organism from the plankton, they eat lots of them. So those small fish end up storing all the mercury from all the different plankton, causing their concentration in the fish to be higher than the concentration in each plankton. Well, that continues all the way up the food chain until the things in the upper trophic levels end up with mercury levels that are so high that they become dangerous and they can cause some, some serious side effects. That's why fish like uh, tuna, for example, oftentimes 
have very high mercury concentrations in them because they're up near the top of the food chain. They're very big predatory fish. Another example of biological magnification um, deals with uh, bald eagle populations. So back years ago, there was a pesticide called DDT, was used to can kill mosquitoes and other crop pests. Some of that DDT ended up in the water. Concentrations in the water were small, but some of that, that DDT was um, absorbed by algae plants, was accumulated because it was uh, fat soluble. The things that ate those plants or algae ended up with a higher concentration of DDT than the plants. Things that ate them ended up with a higher concentration than the level before. Ultimately, what ended up happening is that the bald eagle, which was at the top of the food chain, um, accumulated a very high level of DDT in its tissues. And the effect that that had on the bald eagles was it, it didn't necessarily kill them, but it caused the shells of their eggs to be very fragile. And those eggs ended up breaking before the baby was ready to hatch out. And it caused them not to essentially be able to reproduce at a normal rate. And it almost called the, caused the extinction of the bald eagle. Ultimately, DDT was uh, banned in either the, around the 60s, I think. And the bald eagle populations are coming back. We can even find bald eagle populations in Gunnersville, even in our area here in Huntsville, Alabama. So here we see a diagram kind of showing you that um, the DDT um, concentrations down here in the water were really minute in the producers, still really small, 0.04 parts per million. In the primary consumers, went up to 0.16 parts per million. In the secondary consumers, 0.28. In the needle fish, the, um, this is probably really more of a tertiary consumer, 2.07. And then up at the top, the concentration got up to 75.5 parts per million. So a huge magnification of DDD concentrations. And that probably in the long run is gonna cause some damage uh, to this goal. All right, that's it for our screencast on um, ecosystem ecology.